All right, what's up? Welcome inside the Open the Line. Corey and Benny coming at you on a rainy Thursday here in the area that we are in. You know what I'm saying? Game six of the NBA Finals tonight. Gonna hop in and break that down uh, pretty soon. Benny, I only had one bet last night. All of a sudden, the New York Liberty are the best team in the WNBA. Um, <laughs> so I don't get it. They won. They lost 18 games in a row. They've won their last two, and I've been betting against them the last two. And um, so. Kind of took a hit last night. I didn't have no baseball action last night. How'd you do last night, buddy? Um, wasn't too bad. I had, uh, you know, the French women in the afternoon who almost screwed that game up with an own goal, but they wound up pulling ahead late in that game to win 2-1, so that was good. And then my big bet last night was the Atlanta Braves, and honestly, it did not work out as I wanted it to. Um, Mike Soroka did not have a very good start at all. The Braves actually gave up a run in the top of the ninth to go down seven six they scored one in the bottom of the ninth and sent it to extra innings I fell asleep I woke up this morning and found out they won eight seven so it actually turned out to be a pretty good day even though I went to bed thinking I was about to lose money no doubt so at least you got the money in your account if you want to make some money and I think my man Duke right now has got the soccer picks he's doing a good job with that that's elite sports betting.com you get in there right now for the cheapest price in the industry um uh, yesterday, Benny, I went down to the uh, show with the homie, Nando DeFino, went down to the athletic offices, had a mock draft going on down there. So I'm going to talk about that. We got that done. You, We are also in Guru Elite right now over here getting ready for the draft kit. Well, the draft kit is out, but as we continue to add content to the draft kit, um, we have a mock draft that just started, a slow draft going on, a best ball 10 style draft, Benny. You had the first pick in the draft. You want to tell everybody what you did? Yeah, I mean, I took Saquon Barkley. You know, that's the way that I went with it. The, the way the scoring is in this, in this league, you know, it's, it's kind of standard scoring, but it also has something for first down conversions added in there as well. And I just figured with the volume that he gets in the passing game and the running game, you know, I mean, again, as long as he stays healthy, Saquon Barkley is going to be an absolute stud. So I figured it's a pretty good way to start off a best ball draft. I went with him. I mean, obviously you have choices. You know, you have Zeke, you have him, you have Kamara, you have – um. Christian McCaffrey, I mean, I'm never – I'm going to be honest, Corey, I'm not going to argue with anybody who takes any one of those four guys in, that, in, any one, in any order. If you start your draft with any of those four guys, I think you did the right thing. To me, though, Barkley's the best of the four. Um, I, I have no beef with that. Um, but, you know, I got to play devil's advocate because I was with a dude that plays devil's advocate yesterday. You know Mike Salfino, right? Yeah, I know who he is. Yep. Yeah. Um. Big time Jet fan, much like yourself, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, he's the Adam Gase believer, which is interesting, you know what I'm saying? Okay. He's the Adam Gase believer. He says Adam Gase can get it done. He won games with Ryan Tannehill. He can win games with Sam Donald. Um, That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> you win games with Ryan Tannehill. You got to be doing something right. Um, here's the thing with the Saquon Barkley pick. At, wherever, at one, at two, at three, at four – Mm-hmm. Whenever you take him at, like I said, it's going to be in the first four picks, first three picks more than likely. Mm-hmm. If Daniel Jones, when Daniel Jones becomes the giant starter at some point this season, what does that do to Saquon Barkley? I'm sorry. Like, listen, I wasn't a big Daniel Jones guy. We had this discussion a couple of weeks ago at the draft. <laughs> and I'm probably going to get some flack for saying this, but is he worse than Eli Manning right now? Well, the thing about it is at least Eli's going to dump the ball off the belt, Barkley. Jones may think, you know what, my arm is strong. Let me start winging interceptions down the field. You could be looking at more stacked boxes. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, there's, there's definitely something to be said there. But, I, again, I don't think he's any worse than Eli Manning. I, I really don't. So, I mean, at this point in time, the way I look at it is it might even be an upgrade because at least he can – at least he has the threat of throwing the ball down the field. Yeah. If you're talking – if you're worried about stack boxes when you have a quarterback who can't throw the ball 30 yards down the field, that's usually when they stack the box against you. As a Jets fan who sat through the Chad Pennington years, who was another guy who couldn't throw the ball I down love, the field. I love Chad Pennington. One of my favorite so players. Yeah, I, I do too. But he has the same All problem. Right, Chad. <laughs> he has the same problem, though. If you can't throw the ball down the field, you know, the safeties are going to only be 10 yards away from the line of scrimmage. They're going to be up there. It's going to be tougher to run. That's the same problem that they had last year, too. So, last year, he still put up pretty damn good numbers. So, again, you know, for me, Barkley's the number one guy. You know, are there things that could go bad for him? Yeah, but, I mean, you could make a, a devil's advocate case against drafting anybody. You know, to me, he's the guy that just has the most 
the most probable production is going to probably wind up with the most touches because let's face it, they just don't have a very good offense, especially now that they got rid of Odell Beckham. Ezekiel Elliott, Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara go off the board. Uh, McCaffrey was my pick. First wide receiver off the board was Odell Beckham at pick number five. Then we see Le'Veon Bell go to the all-in kid. Uh, then we see Devontae Adams as the second wide receiver off the board. Then we get D-Hop as the third wide receiver off the board. Then Melvin Gordon, Antonio Brown, um, David Johnson, DBR closes it out. Derek Van Riper on a one-two turn of Todd Gurley, James Conner. I do not like that one-two turn right there. And I don't like Antonio Brown going over Julio Jones, Michael Thomas, and Juju Smith-Schuster. Yeah, I mean, I like I like Michael Thomas a lot more than uh, Antonio Brown. That would have been my pick in that spot. Again, I, I mean, I'm not I'm not as high on a Gurley. You know, I'm not as high on Gurley this year, mostly because of the injury stuff that I'm worried about. Is, is the Gurley pick what you had a problem with, or the Connor pick? Oh, uh, that just that's just, just a bad turn. Like, if I don't want to come out. I hate to say it, because DBR is my man. You know what I'm saying? Right. But I would. I don't want to come out my first two picks. With Todd Gurley and James Conner, I'm going to feel like, like I like I shit the bed. You know what I'm saying? I don't like how Conner finished last year, and mm-hmm. Gurley is somebody that I'm that I'm just not into at all. Yeah, I mean, listen, you you got two guys that are ultra productive right there. The biggest problem I would have with it is there's no way that you're going to go into a Super Bowl with that team with those two guys as your running back. Exactly. One of those two guys is not going to be there at the end of the year, if not both of them. Yep, you're 100% correct. Um, the dude in front of him, uh, my man Gary Davenport, I like his turn, David Johnson, Joe Mixon. That was a good turn. Um, Salfino was the guy who took Anthony uh, – was, was, was the guy who took Antonio Brown as the fourth wide receiver off the board. Salfino is one of these – he's a numbers guy. You know what I'm saying? He writes for, like, Wall Street Journal and shit like that. So mm-hmm. like a, basically like a investigative reporter of fantasy sports. And – he was talking about John Gruden's track record with 30-year-old wide receivers and how he just feeds, feeds, and feeds, and feeds, and feeds veteran wide receivers, which he was like Antonio Brown would probably have more targets than anybody else in the NFL this year. And I was like, I get it, but you don't have to take him in the first round no more. Well, see, my whole thing, especially when you go into a draft is, you know, even like with the NFL draft, when we talk about it, right? Like, it's not that Daniel Jones was a horrible pick. It's that Daniel Jones at six was a horrible pick. Exactly. You know, and, and that's the thing you got to understand is you got to understand your board. If you like Antonio Brown, but you're the only one willing to draft Antonio Brown in the top 20, then you don't need to take him at eight because you probably could have got him on a turn at, what would he have had? What was he, 10, 10 out of 12? So he would have yeah. had like 15 on the way back or something, 14 on the way back. You could have got him at 14 and taken – you know, somebody he else. Started, that, he could have started Michael Thomas, Antonio Brown. Yeah, exactly. If you're trying to build wide receiver, wide receiver, that's probably the better way to go. Now, he probably got lucky and still could have had – who did he take on the way back? Because those guys were still available, right? Travis Kelsey. What's the scoring? And, again, I don't think that's crazy PPR. either. Because PPR. It's regular PPR. And it's yeah. not crazy. Listen, two Titans went in the second round. Kelsey and Ertz. Yeah. I don't have a problem with, the Kelsey, with Kelsey in round two. Ertz, Ertz played 16 games last year. Ertz is not going to play 16 games this year. That's my only knock against Ertz. I'll be drafting the other cat, Dallas Goddard. I'll be taking a flyer on him late. They already said they want to get him mixed into the offense more some, uh, this year. Anyway, mm-hmm. uh, I don't have a beef with the Kelsey pick, um, but a Michael Thomas, Antonio Brown, but he would have looked better to me. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a pretty strong wide receiver pairing to start off with if you're going that way. I mean, obviously, it pushes you into kind of – kind of looking at a zero RB roster build if you start off with the two stud wide receivers like that. But, you know, you're going to have an advantage at wide receiver with those two guys being the first two guys you put on your roster. After Salfino takes Kelsey, get a run of wide receivers, Julio, Michael Thomas. Michael Thomas as wide receiver six midway through the fifth second round. That's a steal. My man, your boy, Chris Meany, Canadian kindness. Mm -hmm. D-hop, Michael Thomas start. That's a nice start, man. That's a, <laughs> that's a really, really nice start. Well done, Meanie. That's a nice start. Uh, then after that, Smith Schuster goes. T.Y. Hilton goes to your boy, the all-in kid. Then we see Amari Cooper go to – Amari Cooper gets pulled up the board by the good buddy, Nando DeFino. I came back. You know my guy was there. I was going to take him. I'm thinking I'm going to have a lot of shares of Damian Williams this year. 
That makes my start Christian McCaffrey, Damian Williams. Then Zach Ertz, Keenan Allen close out the second round. When I came back in three, Benny, I had that age-old fantasy question, Adam Thielen or Stephon Diggs. Again, I mean, we talked about this before. I'm going to always lean Thielen. Yeah. In that situation, but I mean, it's not it's not a knock on Diggs at all. I like Diggs a lot. I just Thielen's been more consistent, and honestly, even had more upside last year. Yeah, no, no doubt. Oh no, he's he, he he was he was amazing last year. I went, I took Thielen right there. Um, AJ Green is coming at a value this year. Where where did he go in the middle of the third? Middle of the third round, wide receiver thirteen off the board. I mean, with with AJ Green, right? It's not a question of talent; it's a question of tennis. Yep. Yeah, that's that's the deal. I mean, you're, the the risk you're taking with AJ Green is not whether or not he's going to be productive. It's whether or not he can be productive for an entire season, or if you're only going to get ten games out of him. Uh, a couple more of my picks. You know, I'm, a, I'm a, I pull the trigger a little bit earlier on a quarterback, so I have Pat Mahomes on this team. Okay, that's the guy to pull the trigger on if you're pulling the trigger early. That's my in my opinion. Where'd you I, get him? I got him at all uh, at go on the four or five turn. Okay, that's not bad. Um, when I came back in five, I had an interesting decision to make. I want to see where you would have went. I wanted to go wide receiver. The guys okay. I was looking at were Cooper Cup, Tyler Boyd, Calvin Ridley, and Tyler Lockett. Cooper Cup, Tyler Boyd, Boyd, Calvin Ridley, Tyler Lockett. Man, I don't think I could pull the trigger on Lockett before Boyd. Cup, for me, it would probably be between Boyd and Cup. I took Cup, and I was very – and when I, I took Cup, Boyd went with the next pick. Yeah, I might have leaned that way too. I think, I think Cup was probably the right – because Cup gets the touchdowns, man. That's, he's underrated. I just worry about first year back from the Achilles tear. See, that would, that's what I was going to say is my big thing with him is I want to make sure that he's healthy and he's going to be good to go. He's a guy that I'd probably be higher on if this draft was in August and you got a chance to see him and know that he's all right, then in June there's a little bit of risk there with him. But listen, I mean, look at you look at the wide receivers that Corey was just talking about there. Those are all guys that I would be looking at around that time. Um, Tyler Boyd is one that we've, we've spoken about before too, who's a guy that I think has a lot of upside this year. <clears throat> and again, the Tyler Boyd, Truthers are also people who are AJ Green haters because I, I think go that far. I'm a Tyler Green truther. Um, a Tyler Boyd truther, Tyler truther and an AJ and an AJ Green guy. I, I put it like this: I'm gonna have. I, I'll say this, Benny. I love AJ Green. You know what I'm saying? Uh, University of South Carolina. But what I'll say is this: I mean, Georgia Bulldog from you know, he's a Georgia Bulldog, but he's a, he's a South Carolina guy. South Carolina wide receivers have good uh, legacies. Um. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just not ever gonna own AJ Green. I'm just gonna be owning Tyler Boyd. You know what I'm saying? But that's what I'm saying, though. So is, if that makes me, a, you know, if that makes me a hater, then so be it. <laughs> I mean, we'll put it this way: you're not gonna draft both of those guys in the same team, right? Like you're not it's taking your third round pick on AJ Green. You can't sustain that, yeah. right? There's just, especially with Andy Dalton and and the fact that they run the ball a lot and all that stuff. Like you're probably not gonna have two big time fantasy wide receivers come off that same team. In order for Tyler Boyd to really have his ceiling, A.J. Green probably has to get hurt at some point during the year or at least be, like, less than uber productive. If A.J. Green comes out and is a 100-something target guy this year, you're probably not getting a ceiling from Tyler Boyd. That doesn't mean Tyler Boyd's going to suck. Like, he's still going to do something. But Tyler Boyd's upside, in my opinion, and A.J. Green's upside are counter to each other. You're not going to get upside from both at the same time. You really need – if one of them is going to go off, it's going to hurt the other and vice versa. Uh, what, was his, what was his ownership rate last year in DFS when, like, the season had just started? But when he Tyler was – Huh? Yeah. Tyler Boyd. Boyd? At one point during the year, he was a guy that was chalk, like, a couple weeks in a row. Okay. But it wasn't the, it wasn't the beginning of the season, though. No. Yeah. It was, it was kind of like after the A.J. Green injury and when he really no – like, Who's the guy that they drafted the burner? Uh, Ross, John Ross. Yeah, like when people realized that Ross was not a thing, and it was really Boyd as you know the number two wide receiver option, and then when AJ Green went down last year too, for when he was hurt, you know Boyd being the number one option overall, there were weeks where Boyd was chalk last year. Oh yeah, no doubt. Um, like you said, I'm I I did a I did a rant about how Tyler Boyd was number one wide receiver 
Calvin Ridley was the number one wide receiver. And um, I, I, somebody else I threw in that mix, too, and everybody was like, Corey's lost his mind. Um, but, the, Tyler, you know, Calvin Ridley, Tyler Boyd, they, these cats put up numbers last year, you know what I'm saying? Calvin Ridley. Juju Smith-Schuster, you know yeah. what I'm saying? These, wide, these second wide receivers put up big numbers last year. Calvin Ridley and Tyler Boyd won people millions of dollars in DFS last year. They were both on. They were both on multiple millionaire maker winning lineups and and qualifier lineups. Both of them were at different points in the year. The one game where Mans had like the best call of the year. He he called Ridley when he was like a four thousand dollar play and like a a fifty five hundred dollar play on DraftKings. He called him for two touchdowns and it was the game he actually scored three. Wow. So that was like everybody had him that week because Mans was all over him and he loved him and literally we all made money that week because he was. He was like 10 or 12 percent, and I don't think we got him that low owned again <laughs> at any point during the season. Nah, so there you go right there. That's a good look. So, Vinny, I'm putting this team together, right? I'm like, okay, cool. Christian McCaffrey, Damian Williams, got Pat Mahone as the quarterback, and I got Adam Thielen and Cooper Cup. And I'm like, this is the whitest team in the history of fantasy football. <laughs> that is true. That is, I think the darkest guy on that team is Pat Mahomes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Good times. Um, so after that, after those guys go off the board, like I said, Cup and, and uh, Boyd went back to back. Then the, then Ridley went. Um, and then a little bit later on in that round, Tyler Lockett went. Second quarterback going off the board was Andrew. I mean, third quarterback. Second quarterback go off the board was Deshaun Watson. Third quarterback was Andrew Luck. Um, I came back on a six seven turn. I took Tariq Cohen and James Washington. Um. I think Washington can have a, a, a season in Pittsburgh this year, Benny, because it's Pittsburgh, it's a wide receiver, and he's very talented, and he should have targets now. So I, I don't disagree with any of that. My question to you, though, is what – now, again, I know it's a little early and ADPs are jumping and going all over the place a little bit, but where has Washington been going? Has he been going that early, like seventh, eighth round? Uh, he goes a little bit later. I, I'm basically pulling him up the board. But – in this range okay. right here is uh, guys like Corey Davis, Larry Fitzgerald, Cortland Sutton, Sterling Shepard. I'm like – I like Corey Davis this year. You're the, you're, you're the first person I've heard say that. I, and you know what? And I'll be the first person holding a trophy at the end of the year because of it as well. All right. Corey da- I, I'm telling you, Corey Davis is due – Corey Davis is a good wide receiver, right? I don't I think – quarterback. I, I was just going to say, I don't think the quarterbacking has been good enough to kind of sustain him. But this is a guy who I think has upside still. You know, a lot of the other guys that you talked about there, you know, a guy like Larry Fitzgerald. Listen, Larry Fitzgerald is a solid play every year. Sooner or later, it's got to stop. But we've been saying that for, what, four or five years now? Like, oh, this is the year he's going to regress. And every year he winds up leading the team in targets. And this year, they're expected to throw the ball even more and have more of an up-tempo, open-spread kind of offense. Larry Fitzgerald could still be a very productive player here. I worry about – millionaire players in well into their thirties learning new playbooks. I just don't see him being, being hungry to learn a new playbook. But here's the deal. Like there, I I don't disagree with you if you're talking about like a diva kind of guy, right? Okay. Larry Fitzgerald is a lunch pail kind of guy. Larry Fitzgerald is the guy who just loves playing football. He's just going to, he's going to wake up in the morning. He's going to put his pads on and he's going to go out there and play because that's what Larry Fitzgerald does. You know what I mean? Like he's, He's not somebody who's going to be – he's not give me the damn ball. He's not, you know, I need more targets. I need to be a bigger part of the offense. Like, Larry Fitzgerald is just going to go out there and play football. And especially at his age, like, you put him in the slot and you just ask him to get open and be a big target and catch the ball with his great hands. I I mean, what he does isn't really going to change. I I think they're going to work what he does into their offense more than they're going to try to make him change and do something else that he doesn't really do. You know what I mean? No doubt. I, I can dig that. Uh, uh, a little bit later on, I came back. I scooped up Geronimo Allison. I got Chris Thompson. I like that pick. Yeah, Geronimo Ger- Allison. I like that pick a lot. Yeah, I got Geronimo Allison as wide receiver 44 in the ninth round. Like um, so um, I'm a Geronimo Allison guy. I saw where yeah. our boy Chris Vaccaro tweeted the other day. Was it Vaccaro? It was, it was, it was somebody. It was, it was one of those dudes. It was either Vaccaro or Sean Gundy. It was one of the big NFFC guys was saying, you know, don't don't even fool with Devontae Adams. Grab Allison, grab NVS, 
and then you'll have that number two wide receiver in the packer in the packer packing order. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I'm I'm a, I'm a big Allison supporter. I also uh, I scooped up Chris Thompson because if he's healthy, he could be the one of the a target monster in DC. Yeah. Uh, I got Edo Smith because why not? Jack Doyle or uh, Taylor Gabriel round out um round out the rest of that one right there, Benny. That's not, I mean, those are some pretty solid guys that you got there towards the end, and especially guys that have some upside. So, wait, Jack Doyle is your tight end? Jack Doyle and Kyle Rudolph. Okay. I, I would play Rudolph more than Doyle right now. To be yeah, honest. yeah, because uh-huh. Eric Ebron looks like he's going to be the man. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, the, Doyle still got targets even before he got hurt when him and Ebron were both in there. But Ebron got all the red zone. I mean, obviously, Ebron had, like, a tremendous touchdown. He had, like, 14 touchdowns last year, which is ridiculous. Um, Kyle Rudolph, though, to me, is the more likely of those two guys to score touchdowns during the year. So he'd probably be the guy that I play more than uh, more than Doyle. Yeah, the most you thought he would have came out and had a big year last year, coming off the big year two years ago, and then yep. Cousins coming in there. And Cousins is a guy who loves to throw to the tight end. But uh, for the most part, Rudolph was irrelevant until uh, pretty late in the season. So there you go right there. We got our draft going on, slow mock. Uh, so we'll give you an update on that one tomorrow morning. As we start to get some of the picks in, like I said, Benny already had the first pick of the draft. He goes Saquon Barkley. My cue is Alvin Kamara and Ezekiel Elliott. I have the third pick. So Rad Thad is between us, waiting on him to wake up, make his pick, and then we'll get the draft rolling and we'll give you an update on that tomorrow. Obviously, fantasyguru.com, ready to rock and roll right now with your draft kit. That's where you will see all of our season-long fantasy football work. So if you want to hop in there and win a championship in 2019, by all means, do so. Somebody uh, could very well win a championship tonight, Benny. Um, that could be the Toronto Raptors. They go into Oracle Arena, the last building, the last game in that building. Um, so that's going to be interesting. Before we get into that, right quick, the kid that the the big poppy thing from earlier this week, right? That wasn't a robbery. That was they, they tried to kill. They tried to kill Poppy. Um, so yeah, I saw, I saw that. that. Yeah, exactly. You know how much money uh, they, we, he was offered for, to, to do that, but essentially hit on Big Poppy? I think I saw $8,000. Was that right? $8,000, man. Can you imagine? That's, crazy. that's all That's all life is worth, apparently, nowadays. $8,000. That's crazy, son. That's wild. You know what I mean? Um, so he's uh, going to be in trouble. But a shout out to the St. Louis Blues. They won a championship in hockey last night. I, I don't think they've ever won a championship, uh, the Blues, so... I've never known a St. Louis Blues fan either, so if that's your squad, then so be it. But if you want some money with them this year, if you're one of those cats that had a big bet on them this year, shout out to you and congratulations to you also. I uh, saw Kevin Durant posted on Instagram yesterday. Surgery was a success. Road to recovery begins. Um, I found this interesting um, thing on Snoop Dogg's Instagram. And... Uh, who is it? Jesus Christ. You know this interesting thing, uh, Benny, on Snoop Dogg's Instagram? Snoop's the man, so I, I want to hear what Snoop had to say. So, it's a cool post, but the post is wrong, though. He has, so basically here it goes right here. It is Kevin Durant on the floor being helped up by other players that have torn their Achilles tendon. Oh, okay. Is that Dominique in there, I see? Yeah, Dominique's in there. Yeah, I remember Dominique, Dominique tore his and, and came back with the league in scoring. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kobe Bryant's in there. Uh, Isaiah Thomas is in there. I don't, I don't remember Isaiah Thomas having this injury. Yeah, I don't either, but okay. Patrick Ewing is in there. I don't remember Patrick Ewing having this injury either. It looks like they just took a whole bunch of guys from the 80s and put them in there, and, and then Kobe. <laughs> DeMarcus Cousins is in here, too. He tore his Achilles? Yeah, DeMarcus Cousins tore his Achilles. But DeMarcus Cousins is in, is in here with a Warriors jersey on. He tore his Achilles as a member of the Pelicans. And, and, and his comeback didn't go all that well this year from the Achilles. So that's probably not the guy you want to put in there. You know what? I think it is because of his, his weight. I really think it's his weight. I mean, not for nothing, but this is something that we talked about before. When you have a big guy and they're out there, once – when a guard gets an injury, yeah, it's going to take him a little longer to recover, but you're not putting as much stress on it. When you're lugging around six feet, 11 inches of body with 275 to 300 pounds of, 
you know, muscle and, and fat and, and bone on top of it, that puts a lot of pressure on a joint that's not 100%. That's why when big guys get hurt, big guys decline after injuries way faster than guards do when they get their injuries. So, exactly. yeah, hopefully it's not one of those things that lingers for the rest of Boogie's career or KD's career, for that matter. Oh, a lot of the U.S. Open stuff popping up on the FanDuel Sportsbook homepage. People getting their bets in. I believe yeah. that's going to start probably this morning, right? Yeah, probably about to start. Nine, honestly, like the next five minutes. I think 9.45 is the – Where is it at? It might be raining. Uh, to be honest, I have no idea. I, I haven't really looked. I had too many other things going on to, to start digging into golf. But, um, you know, if you're one of those people that's in on it, I mean, I know there's a lot of people out there that do a lot of golf betting. and EliteSportsBetting.com, they got you covered over that joint. They have a full write-up for the, uh, for, the, for the U.S. Open as we get ready to head into a Father's Day weekend. Um, but first, we got to get to this NBA. Uh, the Raptors catching two and a half tonight. Dubs is minus 146 on the money line. 211 is the total, Benny. It's going to be a dogfight. I can guarantee you that. I'll tell you right now, I'm not betting it. I'm not betting the, the total or the line at all in this game. But if I did, the value is on the Raptor side of it. I agree. Yeah, that's – I mean, the value is the Raptor side of it. That's the, that's the side that you want to be on tonight. Yep, I agree because the, the Raptors are tough. You know what I'm saying? I understand last game at Oracle and all of that, but, but, the, but the Toronto Raptors, they don't give a shit about that. You know what I'm saying? They're one game away from winning an NBA championship. You know, they, they could care less whether they do it in Oracle or they have to go back to Toronto and do it. That's why people are like, oh, they want to go home and win in Toronto. No, you, you're up 3-2. You don't take that chance. You have a chance to win that game. You go and you win that game. And you get your championship and you say, you know what? We'll win it for the home fans another time. They ain't going to be mad. They'll all be lined up at the airport when you come home anyway. So Jurassic Park will, def- will be satisfied if you win the championship tonight. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people look at it as a foregone conclusion that the Dubs are going to go in here and close down Oracle Arena and staff. But I will, say, I will caution against this. Kawhi Leonard, don't give a shit about that, son. You know what I'm saying? So uh, be careful. And you're right. I do believe the value does lie with the Raptors. I mean, well, you figure, you figure that's the narrative that everybody's talking about, right? It's like the, the, the Warriors winning at Oracle and closing it out. So you're probably getting value because people are just betting on, oh, yeah, they're, they're going to win. It's the last game at Oracle. They're going to win. It's the last game at Oracle. That's why the value is on the other side with the Raptors. No doubt. Um, but we can get into the player props, Benny. We can do that. Um, what, where, where do we start with? We go on points. You got any specific players you want to talk and talk about? Yeah, so I mean, my favorite bet overall, you're getting Clay Thompson at uh, the over under on Clay Thompson points is 23 and a half for a minus 110 on DraftKings. I don't know if it's the same on. Yeah. Minus 120 on FanDuel. What is it? Minus 120. Minus 120? All right, so on DraftKings, you're getting a little bit better. You're getting about an extra dime there. You look at the games that they played in, right? So game one, Clay had 21, so that would have been an under. Game two, we went for 25. Game three was the game he didn't play. Game four and game five, though, he's really taken a step forward in, in the scoring, right? So 28 points in game four, 26 points in game five. <clears throat> if they're going to win this game, they're going to need Klay Thompson and Steph Curry to score because they really don't have, especially with KD going down now, and, and you know, there really aren't that many other guys in this team that can put the ball in the basket. You know, Andre Iguodala, more of a defensive player. You know, even Draymond Green is a, you know, 10-point-a-game guy playing 40-something minutes. If you don't get points from Clay Thompson and Steph Curry here today, they're going to lose. And Steph has actually been, you know, a little bit more up and down with his scoring. He had that big 47-point game when Clay Thompson didn't play in game three. But really, the other games of the series, he's only averaging like a little below 30. I think he had 24 the one game, 27 the other game. He had 31 one game. Um, you know, really hasn't been putting up. Very good job on him defensively for the most part. Well, that's the thing is what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep the ball out of his hands. And what they're really trying to do is not let him shoot threes. His three-point shooting has been down in this series. He had six in the game. He had 47 where there was no Clay Thompson. But the other four games in the series, four, three, two, and five. Yeah, so, well, you know, you're basically talking him averaging about three and a half threes a game, which, again, in the overall scheme of things, is a lot of threes. For Steph Curry, though, that's the low end of three-point shooting for him. So that's why. And then Clay Thompson, the last two games for Clay, seven threes, six threes in the last two games. First two games before the injury, he had three and four. He has a three and a half over on his three point prop. So I like the over, although 
It's like at a minus 148 on DraftKings. I don't know what it is on FanDuel. Minus 170. Oh, geez. There is no value in minus 170. But over three and a half is definitely something that I think he hits. Um, that would be something that I'd probably wind up parlaying together with something else. Yeah, and it's, but it'd I, be like a stupid-ass baseball team that'll lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like the Braves almost did for me last night. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the clay at 110 on DraftKings, even 120 on FanDuel for over 23 and a half points is probably my favorite bet uh, of all the bets going out. I already put it in at minus 110 on DraftKings here today. Um, that's probably my favorite one of all the props. Um, I, I, I like those two also. Anything on the Toronto side that you're looking at? Not really. I mean, what, is the, what do they have them on FanDuel? What do they have the over-under for Kyle Lowry points? Probably, probably going to be 14 and a half. See, here's, here's the deal. For me, anytime I can get it at under 14 and a half, I like it. Anytime it's over 15 and a half, I like the under. It's 15 and a half today. Okay, so I was going to say 15 is the number for me with Kyle Lowry. So 14 and a half, 15 and a half, I'm probably not going to touch it. Um, if it was over 15 and a half, I would take the under. And if it was under 14 and a half, I'd probably take the over. 15 and a half is about where that number should be today. So I probably won't touch it. Uh, the triple double prop. What, what do they have it on FanDuel? On DraftKings, it's plus 250. It's 220. I, uh, You're not getting nothing for it. It's, it's not it's, fun no more. It's basically a three to one. Like they're offering you three to one on it. You know, I, I had trouble taking it at plus 400, Corey. So at plus 220, plus 250, it's I like. Heard. Yeah, I really don't think it is. I mean, you know what I like, actually? I was looking at it. I don't know if they have it on FanDuel. They have it on DraftKings, though. They do a total of points plus rebounds plus assists. Yeah. Draymond's is 31, I think, for minus 121, which I think is a pretty good number. Um, You know, like, like first game he had the 10-10-10 triple-double, 17-10-9, uh, 17-7-4, 10-9-12, 10-10-8. So he's been right around that number. What do they have him for the double double? The double Draymond double double. He's double doubled in four of these five games. Jay Draymond double double is probably it's probably minus one twenty five. I I can't even find that right now. Let me see. It's if I minus one seventy on DraftKings. If it's minus one twenty five, I'd be all over that. Oh, um, I was gonna say anything under minus one fifty. I like that bet. Um, I'm have to uh, uh, go through that one and find that one. Um. It's interesting. His interesting one. Top point scorer of the game. Steph Curry is minus 115. Klay Thompson is plus 700. Kawhi Leonard is plus 130. Pascal Siakam is plus 3,900. I mean, if you wanted to throw a little something in there, Siakam could outscore Kawhi. Could, could, see, basically for the Warriors. Klay is not a bad one either, Benny, at plus 700. Who's that? Klay Thompson, plus 700 to lead the game in scoring. See, I don't think Clay will ever outscore Steph. Okay. And, and the reason for that is, like, even, like, even the last couple games, like, Steph's only had, you know, three or four three-pointers the last couple games. Clay's hitting six and seven. But Steph Curry gets to the free throw line and, and goes to the basket for those layups and stuff. People forget how much that, that adds up. Like, the reason why James Harden is always one of the top scorers in the league yeah, he can hit shots, and yeah, he does all that. But the guy also shoots double-digit free throws every game. Every night. Yeah, and, and again, if you're a Steph Curry, if you're a James Harden, you know, Steph Curry especially, you're hitting 80 90% of your free throws, and you're shooting 10 to 12 of them a game. That's a free 10 or 11 points that he's getting that, you know, makes up for the, the extra couple threes Clay might hit. Uh, a couple of bets that I, I would take a look at tonight. <clears throat> the first quarter, the Golden State Warriors are minus half a point. At minus 112, the Warriors should win the first quarter of this game. It's going to be a rocket joint at Oracle Arena. I, you can also get the Warriors' first quarter money line at minus 126. Um, but obviously, you take there's a half a point. A half a point. Yeah, it's so one point that, anyway. Yeah, you take it as one point anyway. You take it at minus 112. Um, so I do think the Warriors in the first quarter is a bet that hits tonight, Benny. Yeah, that's one that I have written down here too. Um, Warriors are minus one on, on DraftKings for the first quarter. So you're actually getting better on FanDuel. Yeah, FanDuel, yeah. Um, so I, I'd probably go over the FanDuel and do it there. You also have minus one and a half for the first half as well. I like the first quarter one a lot better, though. Basically, and Corey, you tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong here. But basically, the reason we like first quarter 
is because it being the last game at Oracle, you figure the place is going to be jumping. It's going to be rocking. They're going to come out strong. You know, whether or not they win the game, they should start the game strong, which is why yeah, we like it. Exactly. Exactly. That, that you're 100% correct. That's why I'm on you. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with that first quarter bet right there. Expect the Warrior explosion on um, right out of the rip. And that, and that, some Clay Thompson threes are probably going in early in that first quarter, too. Uh, what do you like for today, baseball-wise, Benny? Um, there's not a ton that I was really all, all about here for baseball. I, I really like Stroman and the Toronto uh, Blue Jays at minus 135 today against Baltimore. Um, Stroman is a guy who keeps the ball on the ground, keeps the ball in the ballpark. And Toronto looked pretty good that offense yesterday, putting up a bunch of runs. That game, you know, was as high scoring as we expected to be. I think we got 14 runs. It was like 8-6 final yesterday. And I think Stroman is one of those guys that can limit Baltimore to maybe three runs. And, again, I mean, you know, Baltimore's bullpen, Baltimore's pitching from top to bottom is just so bad that even though Toronto's not a, a stud offense, I expect them to get some runs. So I like the Blue Jays are probably my favorite bet here, Stroman, minus 135. Another thing I'm going to do to try to get some money here today. I'll say right quick, it's raining here. It's a good chance to be raining in Baltimore. So you want to keep an eye on that throughout the course of the day. It's a good chance it's going to be raining on the entire East Coast. There's a home game for the – again, there's only like nine games on the slate tonight. That's a home, a home yeah. game for the Mets, which may not wind up going off. The Nationals are home. Yeah, the Nationals are the same thing as Baltimore. The weather's going to be kind of the same there. So you may wind up with only five or six games here. I'll tell you one that should be okay, though. It looks like the weather's going to be fine in Chicago. The Yankees are playing the White Sox here. And then you guys know I'm a Yankee homer, but I'm actually not even going to talk about the Yankee side of it. J.A. Happ is a guy that has very severe splits. Right-handed bats absolutely crush him. Um, 13 home runs this year for righties and only 54 innings of work. Chicago White Sox have a very good home run hitting ballpark as well. So I'm looking for guys, right-handed power, that can take J.A. Happ deep. Two guys that stand out to me. One of them is Jose Abreu, uh, plus 325 for Jose Abreu to go yard off J.A. Happ. The other guy is Welling Beef Wellington Castillo, the catcher plus 400 to go yard off J.A. Happ. And this is a guy that throughout his career has always crushed left-handed pitching. So I'm looking at Abreu at plus 325, Wellington at plus 400. Two guys that I think have a good chance to go yard off J.A. Happ today. Uh, I like it, Benny. Yep, I like it. I'm getting them at – I got Abreu at 340 on FanDuel. And I don't have Castillo at all. Jesus Christ, draft the FanDuel. Well, I would look if he's 340. I'll probably take my Abreu over on. Uh, I got some money on the Fanduel account too, so I'll probably take Abreu on the Fanduel side. Um, I think well, Castillo not. on that. Castillo's not an option on draft on on a Fanduel. Yeah, so I'll have to take Castillo on the DraftKings side. But I wanted to get a little exposure to both. Maybe put like 50 bucks on both of them. Um, at plus 340, that 50 turns into a little over 200. At plus 400, it turns into 250. Um, so two hundred dollar profit and like a hundred seventy something dollar profit on uh, on Abreu. So I'd be happy with that if either one of them goes yard. Jose Abreu, there you go, right there. And that game, like you said, Chicago. That game should be played. Nightcap tonight: the Dodgers and the Cubs. That'll be the late action. Um, so there you go, right there. Get ready to hop on out of here. I think I already shot. Give a shout out, big piece of chicken to the St. Louis Blues and their fan base. Yeah, well, I'm going to give it to the St. Louis Blues, but I'm going to give it to the St. Louis Blues for a different reason. I'm going to give it to the St. Louis Blues because now we don't have to listen to those Boston guys talk about fucking title town for the next, you know, eight to nine months until the next final comes along. So just for that alone, St. Louis, you guys, you guys are my new favorite hockey team. There you go. You get a big piece of chicken, St. Louis Blues. For my main man, Benny, I'm Corey Parson, the fantasy executive, the opening line. We are out.